Welcome to Cosmic Scene with Jill Jardine. I'm your host, Jill Jardine, longtime astrologer, psychic healer, and yogi with a master's in counseling psychology. My guest in today's episode is Amira Hall. Amira is a spirit medium. She's serving as a bridge between the spiritual and physical world. She has a lot to share in this episode today, so stay tuned. Welcome to the episode with my guest, Amira Hall. Amira is a spirit medium. She has been refining her skills as a spiritual medium teacher and mentor for two decades. She has traveled the world to study various teachings and trained with many advanced enlightened teachers. Amira has published three books, Love Up Your Life, Manifesting Miracles 101, and The Essential Guide to Spiritual Awakening. These are a way to have access to her teachings for those whom a reading personal session is either not necessary or outside of one's price range. Over the years, Amira's profound validation and messages have led to numerous media appearances and high-profile clientele, both of which have helped build a reputation of being the best in the business. Amira's years of training are evident in her countless profound validations and messages. It makes a session reading with her extremely valuable. She is sought out by those in grief for the pristine quality of the reading they will receive, and for many, a visit with Amira is a -a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Amira lives her life to maintain the best channel for spirit and therefore the best psychic medium for her clients. While many professionals leave their work at the office, Amira embodies many facets of her psychic work throughout each day in order to be the best medium she can be for her clients. All of Amira's daily routines reflect this truth from what she chooses to put in her body, the way she arranges her physical surroundings, her physical and mental practices, and other professionals she chooses to seek medical and energetic support from. Amira talks the talk and walks the walk. I'm very happy and honored to introduce you to my guest today, Amira Hall. Welcome, Amira. Thank you so much, Jill. That was a real mouthful, wasn't it? (laughs) It's a lot to digest even for me listening to it, you know, and I've been through it. (laughs) Right. It's sometimes funny to hear like your your bio back to you because you're like, who is that? Who is that person? Oh, yeah, that's me. So I'm I'm so honored that you're here with us. I just was thinking we'd start off the podcast with you telling my listeners what is your specialty? What what is it that you do? And maybe describe what a reading might be like with you if they are interested. I think they're all going to be peaked after this podcast. So you want to let them know what it is that you offer. Well, you know, it's an interesting journey that I've been on. And quite honestly, one that has all of my clear abilities that have been developed. That's the clear audience, the clear sentient, the clear voyance, the, the clear uh, cognizance. So it's it's almost like, where do I start? So right now, I see an incredible need for people to access death and the loss of so much in their lives. I've been calling myself a spirit medium, but many of my clients call me the soul mystic because I have a broad range of aspects that I call on when I'm doing a reading. I'm able to dial into energetic pockets within a person. I can see their energy frequency. So if I hear something, I'm guided by that. If I see something or feel something, I communicate that so that we can find the core issue of the problem at at bay. And oftentimes people come to me with one issue, but I identify something completely different that's really at the core of the issue. So we often get tricked, don't we, on our path. We think we're looking for one answer, but really the solution comes by answering something else. Right, that's that's right. People come, they present with one question or concern, and as you start unraveling the story, you see that the root goes deeper and that they have to clear that deeper piece so that the life goes more in alignment. So I totally get what you're saying. The other thing is that 
you also have had quite the awakening journey of your own. And I'm sure that the listeners would like to hear about your process in getting to where you are and the awakenings of your own gifts. So can you give us a brief overview of your own journey to your soul and the soul, what we call cities or the powers of the soul? Yeah, certainly. Um, You know, I was reflecting on that. It's been a walk of spiritual discovery for over 40 years. And, you know, when we're in the process, when we're healing physical ailments, like I think the one of the one of them, because there's been many, many, um, you know, significant, uh, uh, you know, landmarks along the journey. I think one, the big significant one that I point out that happens for a lot of people that triggers the spiritual awakening is I got divorced. I was still in process when my father died. And then I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome. And the doctors told me I had two choices, death or wheel. And that was in, back in 1999, uh, 91. And from that, I lost my job because I couldn't work. So I had four massive blows. Whoa, yeah. And stresses. Four and losses, triggered, big loss, big loss all at once. Huge losses. So that pretty much put me into a cave. You know, I was like, I was in a new country. I'm Canadian born. I was in the United States. I didn't have very many friends yet. Um, I was trying to find my way in a foreign country, newly divorced with no support system. You know, there was no internet. There was nobody talking about autoimmune issues. There was a medical system that told me death or wheelchair. And after crying for two weeks, I thought, well, I I guess I'm going to (laughs) live. I've got to figure it out here. And, you know, that's what started me down the journey of taking personal responsibility. I think the medical system did me a favor. You know, and I couldn't emphasize that enough right now where we're at in time. Right. That's such right? a good point. And we, I mean, even though it's 30 years later, I don't think that for autoimmune disease, there has been that much forward thinking, uh, you know, people find their, their healers through alternative, but I think that allopathic medicine hasn't really come that far from where it was in the early nineties. Would you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, there's way more people that are talking about detox. Um, I, I, I learned about it, first of all, you know, trial and error, and I, and I wasn't really good at sticking with it. It took me a longer period of time to, to heal it, to resolve it, because it was hit and miss. It was a trial and error, and there was absolutely no coaches or nobody to, no internet to even search for. So I, I learned that I couldn't trust the medical system, and so it did me a favor. Because I think what's happening right now is people are being shaken at the core. Their fear of dying is so great that it is derailing them on on their path. Or it's catapulting other people into, I got to do this now because it's do or die. Oh, pardon the pun. You know, it's like, just go for it. So there's two sides I'm, I'm seeing. But it is a wake up call. It is shaking us up to listen to our intuition. What feels and sounds right to you, you know, and all of those traumas get triggered. So, so I processed all that. I started to get more healthy. I got back into where I was, was before that, which was in corporate. I was working in executive sales and and what happened over time, I got, you know, I I don't want to say fat and happy. I didn't quite, but I started getting into the groove of that corporate lifestyle, eating out again and going to fine dining and, and drinking and partying and, you know, really enjoying a better life. But then I, something happened and I started hearing this, this little call to go. I I kept hearing like a little sound in my head. And I I had no clue what that was. I I knew I wasn't going nuts, but I wasn't, you know, it it was an intermittent thing. So finally, I got this brochure from this friend um, about this trip to Peru. And that's when I thought, well, you know, if I get my uh, tax return, a refund, then I'm going to go to Peru. And so I found myself in Peru like four months later 
and a journey in the Amazon with a shaman and exploring that whole thing. I had no idea what ayahuasca was. I had no idea what the sacred ceremony was. I had no idea. I, I didn't go there for that. It wasn't a commercialized journey at that time, right? Right. Oh, my gosh. Well, we're we're you, talking 1997. Oh, wow. Yeah, before people even knew what ayahuasca was around here. So that was a big 180-degree turn from corporate corporate world to, like, journeying well, in the Amazon, doing ayahuasca, having having psychedelic experiences. Well, and I didn't know what that was. I didn't really even know. I'm not a person that's indulged in or experimented with drugs. I didn't even really know what psychedelic. I kind of perceived what that was by the word, but I think they call it an hallucinogenic. So All right. even then, I didn't know what that meant. Um, all I know is from San Diego to Lima, Peru, I cried. I cried on the plane. I cried in strangers' arms. I was really having a meltdown because I could feel something big coming. Right. I, I knew that a part of me was dying and I knew, I thought maybe the plane was going to crash. I mean, that was my mindset. And so it didn't, <laughs> I got to the jungle. I did that. And one of the ceremony processes for me was I saw myself coming through a stargate as a star seed. And I didn't know that word. I just went, what? It's shaped in the shape of a diamond, like four sided. They called it a stargate. And keep in mind, this is 1997. There, I don't even think Stargate was created yet. Oh yeah, it was. Maybe there was it a was. lot. We was were it? we were all plugged into that. There was, uh, oh, okay. you know, I was I had a star chamber Stargate in my healing oh. room, in my oh, house. Wow. So yeah, there were uh, pockets of people who were okay. very tuned into all of this. And so I was not. It, but so I had to there go you down were there found it. it you were yeah. called to it. Yeah, that's excellent. So so what happened? And and what what so, kind of so, stuff did the shaman do with you down there? Oh well, in in the initial stage, the first day, I um it was an interesting because I had a crack and headache, um that I thought my head was going to blow off. I I didn't vomit like everybody else did because I had been detoxing. I detoxed for about a month before I went down there. And so none of that happened for me, but my head was going to split open and I had like four shaman working on me, rattling and chanting and singing. And for a good hour and a half, it seemed like eternity at the time. And uh, all of a sudden I saw this great big, great puff of smoke spiral out of my forehead. And in that moment, I knew it was a person, a spiritual person that I had worked with while I was in San Diego. Other friends had connected me to this man who called himself a shaman. And I say that because there's a lot of people that call themselves right. things. Fake and shamans. that's why I think I have such a hard time labeling what I do. You know, when you're following the light or you're a light worker, even that's limiting, right? Right. Um, but when all your spiritual abilities open up, you're all of it. You can you can access any of it. So so anyway, I saw his energy unplugged from my shot, my sixth chakra. And it was like he was plugged into my power source, my vision inside my head. And it was like a huge aha moment. In that moment, I knew I had to unplug from all those friends in San Diego when I went back. So it was like an interference or a, almost like, yes. a, like an entity possession. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And, and, and he was a living person. Right. So, so he, for me, wow. that was pretty profound. That's a teaching for all the listeners out there. People just dabble and they are not really sure what the, I was just talking to a client about this day. They dabble and then they get entities and they don't know what that is, but they're not quite themselves and it interferes with their connection to source. So Absolutely. That, that was, Absolutely. I completely a thousand percent agree with you. And in fact, that's one thing I have help people with is detaching. So there could be a lot of things. It could be a guru that you worked with because right. the guru game is where you actually plug into your guru. You're not plugging into the source. You're plugging into the guru's source through the guru. So it's like a bypass or even like they call it a backup uh, power or a UPS. Well, you know, yeah, it's, it's the old gateway. Yeah, it's the old Piscean a paradigm of that you need a mediator to get to source. Where here in the Aquarian age, we can go directly to source. Now there are teachers that will help you do that. They just get out of the way. They it's almost like they they do the shakti. They light they light you up, but then you 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 do all your own work. You know, so it's, well, that's that's the key is yeah. finding a mentor that isn't going to suck your juices, so to speak, but help you align with your own 
and help you raise the vibration, hold you in a space where you can raise up without, you know, backtracking. And, and yet they, it's, it's an empowerment, not, and true empowerment has to do with energetics. Right. And there's a lot of teachers out there that haven't learned that. I see, especially in the West. Yeah, they haven't learned that. Well, they want—they still have ego. They have ego attachment. Yeah, and to it like, becomes manipulation, doesn't it? Right. They want to be the teacher. They—they're they're not there to open up the, uh, the client or the student to their own source. They want to somehow be an intermediary, and that's just not how it works. So, all right. Well, continuing with your story after that, okay. Shaman so then, detached so yeah, you from the profound. entity and cleared you. What right. happened? Well, um, the next day I saw this, I came through the Stargate and I was shown that I came to Earth at the early stages of Egypt. And it wasn't really Egypt as we know it today. It was a much greater area that it encompassed. It felt more like Iraq or um, somewhere in that vicinity, but I didn't, I didn't follow it. I didn't need to know. That's when my soul embodied a human form. That's all I know. Wow. I didn't, I didn't go down the trail of digging more. I didn't need to. I, that was sufficient for me just to know that I kind of let go of it for a lot of years, but I knew in that moment I needed to go to Egypt. I knew that was the next stepping stone that I needed to take. And I got back to San Diego um, I remember the shaman saying, hold on to the light, hold on to the light as long as you can. And I felt it for about a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks after I returned, and I felt it slowly fade. Right. It's because the vibration is so much lower in, in the community where I was at, and it was really hard to hold on to that super high vibration. Right. That's people yeah. need to understand that when they go to these vortex or spiritual sites around the planet, you feel like so plugged in. Then you go back to your, you know, the dense, the density of San Diego or the density of whatever. Anywhere. Yeah. A big city. Yeah. yeah. Whatever city in America or density, it doesn't even have to be a city of the environment you're in. If it's not, you know, connected your society, right. Absolutely. Your society, you're going to lose it. And it takes so much more to maintain the light. That's a great, great point to, um, well, and I also, also want to say that happens, Jill, even when we go to a weekend workshop. Exactly. Or we, you know, we go, we get our fix, you know, because there's seminar junkies and workshop junkies and they go from one to the next or they find a teacher. I don't want to mention any branded names, but they become like their followers and their groupies. Right. And that's, they go to get their fix. And a couple months later, they need another plug in. Right. And all they're doing is basically plugging into the guru. And it's not their true vibration. So, so yeah, so I, I, I figured out that I needed to go to Egypt and I found somebody that was going to Egypt, had a group going and I, I joined the tour and that was in 1998. And that was truly life tra transformational. I saw a granite statue smile at me. I heard wow. celestials, you know, chanting and in the temples, um, there, there, I can't even remember all of the most profound, uh, spiritual moments, but it was just off the charts Did and you... I've been back 13 times. Oh my gosh. Then. 13. Yeah. So do you ever get any past life flashbacks when you're there in Egypt? Have you had Absolutely. that? I mean, and that was one of the things when I landed there, everything felt so familiar. It, it was like, I'm home. I'm home. So you found your and, soul home. You found your. Oh, it was it, it was truly can't find the words to really define it or explain it. You know, and and I hear that from so many of the people. I take groups. In fact, I've got one coming up in October um, this year, uh, and it will be a sacred journey where we're going to actually do a ceremony inside the Great Pyramid, private. Um, on the great eclipse and that's oh my it, gosh so, significant yeah so you've been there to egypt 18 times so this will be 19 no, 13 13 I think the, yeah yeah oh yeah. so this will be 14 then and give us give us the date let let listeners know because i'm sure people will be well, interested the dates in this. have not been absolutely solidified but it will be at the end of october through november so november i think it's sixth or eighth is the eclipse the eighth november so, 8th yeah. is the the I, lunar eclipse scorpio sun taurus um right moon but the the solar eclipse leading up to that is the 25th of october so you're probably going to be there for the eclipse window then that's that's what we're aiming for so we're working out the logistics right now waiting for egypt to get back to us so 
you know how that goes. Well, maybe if you don't, <laughs> they're just a little bit slower. <laughs> uh, okay. So, and so how many people will you bring? Like what's your group size? Well, our maximum size is going to be 30. Um, I like to work with intimate groups. Um, myself and Mary Lamondo are hosting it. Mary is an astrologer herself. And she has, she lives in Luxor part-time. She's an Egyptologist in her own right. And she's an American born. So she, she explains um, what we see from a whole different level. It's more of a spiritual understanding and yeah, versus the classic Egyptology, because a lot of the stories and the information that we start receiving is quite different than what the textbooks say. Oh, that so. sounds so exciting. My guest today is Amira Hall. You can check her out at her website, www.amira, A-M-I-R-A-H, Hall, H-A-L-L, all one word, dot com. And check out her offerings. When we come back, Amira will tell us more about near-death experience and spiritual awakening. So stay tuned. Welcome back. My guest today is Amira Hall. Amira, you talk about a near-death experience in your book. Can you tell our listeners more about your NDE, near-death experience? It's quite the journey, actually. Um, that also happened because of some drugs. <laughs> uh -oh. I'm not, I'm not, yeah, I'm not somebody that does pot. I just want to put that out there um, or any drugs really. And what happened was I was buying beads. It was my last day there and I bought some beads because I'm a jewelry designer and I was buying these little antiquities to incorporate in my jewelry making. You mean so in, Egypt? Back, in Egypt? Yeah, I was oh. buying the antiquity, okay. the, the ancient beads. Okay. That, See, it was in outside the Valley of the Kings, this small town called Kurna, and they their houses at this time were perched up right against the mountain. So their homes would have a wall at the back, right? The mountain was their wall. So they would dig holes, jackhammer at night, and then in the day they would cover that hole up with a carpet. <laughs> so they were digging in the mountain all the time. And I figured somebody in that little village must have had the antiquities or some of these little beads, you know, some treasures that I could take home. Well, long story short, I found the beads um, and I went to pick them up, had my money to pay the guy who was a friend of a friend. And that's how I found it. And it uh, turns out they, uh, you, you know, celebrate when you buy something. They, you sit and you visit. You have a cup of coffee. You have some tea or a Coca-Cola, water, and uh, they visit, you know. Well, this time they brought out a joint and all of a sudden, like 10 guys showed up in the room. And I was, you know, I said, thank you. I don't smoke. And they started shouting. Mohammed was the guy and his arms were in the air and he was getting louder and louder. I'm the only female. I, you know, I'm trying to keep the peace. I don't like confrontation anyway. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, I've insulted him. No, thank you. I don't smoke. And he goes, it's the best. It's the best. And I'm like, oh no. Uh -uh. So I'm thinking, okay, well, I've smoked a couple of times. It never did anything for me. So, all right, I better keep the peace, you know, and I don't, I don't want anything crazy to happen here. So I did, the joint went around a couple of times and I've, everybody bounced up and ready to walk out the door, except for me. I couldn't move my arms and I couldn't move my legs. Oh my God. And I found myself standing behind myself and I didn't know what was happening other than I could see everybody out in front of me. It was like their life was, became a movie screen. And I could see, like I was looking at, you know, I don't know how many guys were there, 10 guys, like I was at Circuit City looking at all these video shots running, you know, and it was freaky. And so I, I, I must have put my hand, well, I did put my hands out in front of me. I don't recall saying anything. I couldn't hear myself say anything because I'm standing behind me, but I'm bouncing back and forth. And I'm thinking, if I just get some water on my face, I can stay in my body. And I went and I put my hands out. My friend looked like he was in slow motion walking towards me. And he poured this water into my, into my hands. And I was watching this whole thing. 
And I remember thinking, oh, shit, my mascara is going to run. <laughs> <laughs> As you're out of your physical body, in your yeah. spirit body, trying to get back into the physical, you're worrying about your mascara. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And and so, and in the village and nowhere, right? But yeah, I was worried about my mascara. So then I, everything went black. Uh oh. And um, they, you know, I don't remember any of this part. They told me I collapsed on the floor. They pounded my chest, that my heart stopped, my breathing stopped. They were pounding with all their might. And in retrospect, I call that Egyptian CPR, you know, it was rather primitive. Um, they dragged me out under the arms, into, loaded me into a truck, put me in the cab of the truck with my head out the window, barreling down the road, trying to get me air. Um, this truck was a taxi, so the back of it was loaded up with people. Oh, my gosh. And there I am in the cab, and they're trying to get me to the hospital. When this is the part, I I remember seeing myself shooting through the sky like a comet. And I'm just this light streak. And I could see, oh, where am I going? And then I could see this small ball way off in front of me. And then it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and going, oh, I remember I'm at, I'm there. And then it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm like, oh, it's, it's so big. How am I going to find myself? And then I heard this language and I'm like, I don't, I don't know that language. And then I went, oh, I remember that's Egypt. And then I found my body but it was like trying to put on wet clothes. Have you ever oh. tried putting on wet clothes oh, or a wet yeah, suit? Oh, yeah, that's wild. It's, so, it's sticky and, and, and icky, and, and I struggled and struggled trying to get, it, get into my body. Well, um, then it, it seemed like I couldn't open my eyes. It was so bright, and I couldn't, it, for the life of me, I sat there for the longest time trying to just open my eyes. And because this was about noon, one o'clock in the afternoon, so high brightness. And I remember just sort of reaching out, sort of feeling my way around because I could hear the voices. And I touched my friend's arm while they just ah, freaked out in Arabic. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's like, like, oh, my God, she's alive or something like that. And um, so they're shouting. And I, and I just said, um, where are you taking me? And they said, in Arabic, they forgot. They were nervous, right? And then they spoke. He spoke in English, and and he said to the hospital, to the hospital. The only thing I could think of was, oh my God, I'm in the village in Egypt. That place will kill me. <laughs> so cause all I could think of was germs or something. Yeah. Really oh primitive yeah, yeah. And the primitive right? hospital in Egypt, right? How right. much so how much I, time had gone by from the time that you? Basically. I have no idea, but probably a couple minutes, okay, maybe five, okay, because they had to get the taxi, and they were screaming on the street and, and yelling and screaming for the taxi to come or a ride, and then you know dragging me out and doing so. I don't know. And All then, I know is the year before that, in 1997, there was a, a massacre. I think 31 people died at Queen Hatshepsut Temple, which wasn't even three or five miles down the road. So they were freaked out because if anything happened to an American at that time or at any time, oh, yeah. um, they would lose everything. They would lose their livelihood. They would lose their, the whole family would go to jail. Right, right. And oh, they don't wow. fool around. Wow, that was some so, potent pot. I'm sure you haven't smoked people well, since, right? No, I, I don't even go near people that have. Um, but But the point is, you know, that 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 wasn't the end of it because uh -oh. keep going. I, I could, what happened I next? I said I need a I need a I need a toilet, and so they're flipping out, thinking where can they take because the toilets are holes in the wall, and oh. they know that I can't stand. Yeah, I'm just completely weak and and propped up, so I needed a proper toilet, and that was a that was a. <laughs> a rarity in the village, but there, his brother had one in his flat. So they, they brought me there. They had to carry me up three flights of stairs, got me in there and brought me into the bathroom. And I wouldn't let my friend Juju leave me. And of course, this is another calamity because in that culture, 
a woman should not be alone with a man in a private room like this because they think we're definitely having sex. Right. Of course, I didn't know that. They're, she, the the sister in law is pounding on the door, freaking out, right? He's sitting on the bathtub next to me, and tears are streaming down his face. And I'm thinking, what, what's wrong? I, I was in total bliss, total peace, total joy, and love. And, and he just said, you don't understand. You died. You died. And he kept saying this over and over. I said, I'm fine. I'm fine. And just, I'm thinking I'm really cool and ladylike because I've got my dress pulled down over my knees, covering my, my butt and my legs on the, on the toilet. Right. And so I'm thinking, well, I'm, I'm proper. (laughs) And so anyway, they finally got me to the bed after I was done there and I laid down for several hours. And what happened was this is when I really started hallucinating or I realized I was seeing through dimensions because I started seeing the goddess Sekhmet in the armoire and the cabinet in front of me. And every time I looked at the wood grain, I could see Sekhmet. If I looked out into the Nile Valley, there was this beautiful window with fluttering drapery and it was um, a breeze coming in the room and this lush green Nile Valley out there. And I just say, I, that's real. I got to keep looking out there. That's real. And every time I look back, so I'm like, I, I'm seeing things that aren't here. But this continued till I got, well, I, I had to get a flight from Luxor to Cairo, Cairo to New York, Atlanta. That's almost 22 hours. And I was still seeing that. So you tell me those are the effects of pot? Whoa. So how many days later? I mean, how many days before well, you left from when you had the experience? I left that day. Oh my gosh. So In that was state? Traveling. How was that? I, I finally was able to walk about three or four hours later and I was wobbly, but I was in total bliss. Like you couldn't imagine. And when I got to the airport, Mary and Vonda, the two tour guides that were with me, they, um, they were there because I had extended my tour, my, my work. This doesn't happen for most people on our tours, by the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I asked them, who's this goddess, the lion face and the female body? They went, oh, that's Sekhmet. Because at the time, I wasn't really plugged into Egyptology. It didn't resonate with me. Yeah. I thought it was really cool and interesting, but I didn't really get it. You know, so yeah. So you had had a what we call a darshan or visitation with Sekhmet in that altered state, and then um, just wrapping up the story. When did you? So you had, as a result of that, you had these gifts that opened your consciousness and allowed you to see between worlds and connect with the other side. As so, how long did that continue when you got back to um, to the states? When I arrived in JFK. All the people there in the airport, in the jetway from there to the waiting area, looked like black and white paper dolls, flat, two-dimensional. And I was horrified. And I was stuck in that space. I stopped seeing the white paper dolls or black and white when I arrived in San Diego. The fresh air and the moist air hit me. Right. That's... And that shifted. But then it took me some time to then learn what happened to me. Right. That's about right. And, New York is black and white paper dolls. And then you get <laughs> you get color vision against when once you get back to San Diego. I don't know about that so much, but <laughs> that's when the journey of really awakening began. Beautiful. Oh, my gosh. Amira Hall is my guest. Thank you for sharing your story of spiritual awakening and your near death experience. And stay tuned for part two when Amira talks about Her books, Manifesting Miracles 101, The Essential Guide to Spiritual Awakening, and Love Up Your Life. Thank you, Amira. Thank you. It's such a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this episode with my guest, Amira Hall. Stay tuned for part two, coming soon. Make sure you download, you share, and give us a five-star review. This is Cosmic Scene with Jill Jardine signing out, sending you healing spiritual vibrations through the quantum field. Duh.